We have a very special guest tonight, Tim Roughgarden, professor at Columbia, head of A16Z Research. Thank you very much for being here. Great. Thanks, Arthur. So, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, for lack of a better title, I wanted to talk today about um, some results and challenges in uh, crypto economics. Um, and I have to say, um, crypto economics is actually not a word I use that much myself. Uh, in my experience, it just means very different things to, to different people. Um, but when Don asked me to give this talk, I was like, oh, OK, let me think. I'll, I'll use this as a chance to ruminate. You know, what is it that's really kind of special and unique about the problems in this nebulous area? And I'm kind of glad I did, because it kind of reminded me of how intellectually fascinating, actually, um, this area is. So I think it's um, useful to compare and contrast cryptoeconomics with the field of mechanism design, uh, which is a traditional field um, of microeconomics. Uh, one way to describe mechanism design is as inverse game theory. So what does that mean? Well, what's game theory? So if we, in game theory, usually a game falls from the sky, right? Prisoner's dilemma, rock, paper, scissors, and then you investigate it strategically. So you ask, do players have dominant strategies in this game? You try to understand the Nash equilibrium of that game. In other words, given the game, you try to figure out what are the outcomes that are most, that are most plausible. So mechanism design is inverse game theory in the sense uh, that you don't start with the game, you start with the outcome. Okay, an outcome that you know, is one that you would like to see happen. So in a protocol context, maybe you'd like to see all of the participants running the protocol uh, as you intended. Or maybe you have scarce resources to allocate. You would like to allocate those in sort of the best possible way. Uh, and then the, the goal is to design a game uh, so that the outcome that you desire actually is an equilibrium of that game. Okay, so again, in the scarce allocation context, uh, maybe you're trying to give you know, one good uh, to one of many of n people. You'd like to give it to the person who values it the most. And so a second price or victory auction is a way of setting up a game so that everybody's incentivized to tell you their true value, which then allows you to uh, allocate it efficiently. Now, traditional mechanism design, you know, like this VCG example, uh, there is often a notion of a currency. So there's payments going to uh, back and forth between participants uh, and the mechanism, and traditionally, Right, you don't really worry about you know, what that currency is. It's just like dollars or something like that, and you don't really think anything more about it. So one really interesting question is, you know, what happens to mechanism design problems if you grant the mechanism the power of access to a cryptocurrency? Okay, so to a currency that is native to the blockchain protocol on which it's running. And this question's exciting for two reasons. Okay, so number one, it expands the design space. It's conceivable that mechanisms with access to a native currency could do things that you could not do without that access. And so for example, as we'll see, you know, one thing you can do in a mechanism with access to the native currency is either mint it or burn it, so to inflate or deflate the currency. But with that additional power also comes responsibility. Right? If you're running like a second price or a Vickery auction, right, you're not worrying about the consequences of your auction on like US money supply. Right? It's really kind of irrelevant. Whereas if your mechanism is doing things like minting or burning a native currency, that has macroeconomic implications. That actually is affecting uh, the currency supply. Okay? So that interplay is something we'll see over the next couple of examples. And I really know of kind of no analog of this in the traditional kind of mechanism design literature. This is really a, a new feature of the problems in crypto economics. So for the first example, let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to Bitcoin. And let's view it through a mechanism design lens. Okay, so what would be the outcome that we're looking to incentivize? Well, we'd like all of the nodes running the protocol to run it as we intended, meaning they should all be working hard to solve their proof of work crypto puzzles. They should all be trying to extend the end of the longest chain. So mechanism design would say, let's set up a game, like for example, payments, so that nodes are indeed incentivized to do this. And probably the most straightforward way to do this and the way it's done in Bitcoin is just to have a block reward. So if you mine a block and that block winds up in the longest chain, then you will get some economically meaningful reward. If it doesn't wind up in the longest chain, you get nothing, okay, in the Bitcoin protocol, at least, okay? And uh, the intuition, hopefully, is pretty clear, right? So as a miner, you only get rewarded for the blocks you create that wind up on the longest chain. How can you make that as, as likely as possible? Well, it sure seems like you may as well start out by putting it on the longest chain such as it is right now. 
Uh, side comment, uh, there's actually um, an old paper by um, Eyal and Surir, which says that that's not fully true. Okay, so there are cases in which it is true. There are other regimes in which actually, while block rewards do to some extent incentivize honest behavior, they even more incentivize uh, other dishonest behavior. So it's sort of a cautionary tale of how hard it is to get the game th theory right in blockchain protocol design. But what I want to focus on here is, all right, so you say you're going to give uh, miners an economically meaningful reward. Where does that value come from? Who pays for it? Okay. And if you did not have access to a native currency, this would be a difficult or maybe even impossible question to answer. If your mechanism does have the ability to, in particular, print money to inflate the currency, then actually there is a answer to this question, and it's what Bitcoin does, which is it mints new coins every time a block is created. That's, in fact, the only way that Bitcoins ever get brought into existence, okay? So with, with that power of the native currency, you are able to manufacture block rewards out of thin air. Not clear how you would do that without that power, okay? But as I said, with power comes uh, responsibility. There are macroeconomic implications of anything like injecting inflation into your currency. Now, the way I described it so far it probably sounds like this inflation is going to go on forever. Right? Blocks keep getting created. I said there were block rewards. That's an increase in the money supply. Uh, but famously, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Nakamoto very intentionally set up Bitcoin to have a hard cap. 21 million Bitcoins is going to be the maximum amount ever in existence. You could imagine other versions of Bitcoin. You could imagine holding everything else the same, Nakamoto consensus, UTXOs, Bitcoin scripts, all that stuff. You could keep it the same and change the monetary policy, and you would get another you know, arguably reasonable variant of the Bitcoin protocol, but that was not what Nakamoto did. Nakamoto made a macroeconomic uh, policy decision to cap the supply. And if you think about it, this has immediate implications for then how, how this inflation is going to work, which in turn, as we'll see, uh, really has interesting game theoretic implications. So given that the Bitcoin protocol never burns Bitcoins, okay, they're never burned in protocol, there's no sync for the currency, for the cap to stay, uh, to, to sort of um, respect the cap, the block rewards must necessarily go to zero, okay, which is scheduled to happen maybe 120 years from now, okay? So if the, if the block rewards go to zero, you then have to ask, okay, well, now let's go back to our original question, like why is it, you know, why are nodes actually incentivized to run this protocol at all? And the vision has always been, you know, if Bitcoin's still being, if it's still, if anyone cares about it 120 years from now, it's probably pretty valuable. Hopefully because it's valuable, there'll be sort of sufficiently large transaction fees that that's good enough incentive um, to have a bunch of nodes running the protocol. It's always been obvious that if transaction fees also stayed really small, that Bitcoin really wouldn't function as we understand it today. But I want to tell you about a more subtle issue, which was investigated in detail um, several years ago in a paper by Carlston et al., which is another difference between block rewards and transaction fees is the block rewards are steady, they're constant. Block to block, it's the same. Like right now, it's six and a quarter Bitcoins. Transaction fees can vary by an order of magnitude or more. Okay, they vary from block to block. And that changes the game theory okay, for miners in the Bitcoin protocol. And in particular, right, so like imagine, okay, you're, imagine the miner just before you cleaned out the mempool, built a block, had tons of transaction fees, and you now have this empty mempool. You're now going to be tempted to, given that there's no block reward, maybe instead of extending that last miner and conceding those transaction fees to that miner, maybe you're going to try to fork it away. Okay, so you, maybe you'll have a competing block at the same block height with roughly the same transactions, hoping the future miners will build on you instead of them. Okay, and in general, miners, when you have high variance in these transaction fees, have an incentive to, to undercut each other. Now here, you know, if this ever actually did become a problem, there's a quite simple tweak to Bitcoin that would actually sort of mostly fix it, which would be to smooth out those transaction fees over time. Okay, so if you mine a block, maybe you get 1% of the transaction fees of that block, but you also get 1% of the transaction fees of the next 99 blocks that get mined. And then the, the reward per block wouldn't be exactly constant, but it would be uh, quite close. Now, 
Interestingly, so that was many years ago, so that was 2016 paper, certainly we didn't yet have DeFi. Now that we do, this exact same story is recurring, okay, and the modern version uh, is in terms of MEV. Okay, so in some sense, block producers sort of siphoning revenue off uh, of the application layer. And even more so than transaction fees, MEV can vary wildly from block to block, so you have exactly these same undercutting issues. You can again try to smooth out the rewards, and so you can Google MEV smoothing to see the latest from the Ethereum community on that idea, but it's definitely harder because while transaction fees are directly observable by the L1, by for example, Ethereum mainnet, MEV comes from the application layer and is not directly observable by the L1. So you need to also kind of make sure that there's a competitive market for block building so that the MEV actually gets expressed at the consensus layer where it can then be smoothed out. All right. So that's example uh, number one. Let's look at another one that shows this interplay between sort of uh, microeconomic decisions and, and macroeconomic uh, consequences. Let's segue from Bitcoin to Ethereum and from block rewards to transaction fees. So let's look at the market for Ethereum block space through the lens of mechanism design. What would be the desired outcome? Well, you might like that to be allocated as efficiently as possible, okay? meaning the blockchain should be fully utilized and the transactions that get included are exactly the ones that value execution uh, as much as possible. All right? Now, hypothetically, if a market clearing price fell from the sky, market clearing price meaning a price that equalizes the supply, so like 15 million gas per block in Ethereum, equalizes the supply with the demand for block space at that price, so like 15 million gas of transactions would exactly would be willing to pay that price, uh, then we'd be good, okay? We have exactly the right amount of transactions getting in, those willing to pay the price, they would also be the most valuable transactions. Now, you know, the market clearing price does not fall from the sky, so your mechanism has to do something else. Uh, and the sort of way it worked in Ethereum until a little over a year ago and the way it continues to work in Bitcoin is a first price auction, which basically says, you know what, let's let the users figure out for themselves what the market clearing price is. They bid, they have to pay what their bid is, and you kind of hope that at equilibrium, uh, the bids are going to be the market clearing price. Okay? That's, that's the hope of that, of that format. And so first price auctions, you know, that's a lot of sort of work for people trying to get their transactions into, into a blockchain. And uh, so that motivated the design of EIP-1559, which is the transaction fee mechanism that Ethereum has been using for now a uh, little over a year. And so here the idea is to make things easier for users, make sure that they don't have to compute the market clearing price, compute it in protocol, or at least compute a pretty good estimate known as the base fee of the current market clearing price, okay? So a little more detail, right? So you have to conti continually adjust the base fee because demand is always changing. Uh, you use the sizes of past blocks as an on-chain signal for whether you should be adjusting the base fee up or down. And the good news is, is that unless the base fee is way off, unless it's way lower than the market clearing price, then in fact, it is completely obvious how you should bid uh, in this transaction fee mechanism. Okay, so under normal operations, it's as trivial to participate in as say a second price auction. It also enjoys some really nice collusion resistance properties which are important in a blockchain context. And interestingly, those collusion resistant properties hold only if you do something fairly counterintuitive with the revenues that are being generated by the base fee. The most obvious thing to do with those revenues is to pass it on to the producer of the block, just like you would with a, with a block reward, but then you're vulnerable to cartels between that block producer and end users. They could then have an off-chain agreement that allows them to circumvent the base fee. So the, what the game theory tells you is that this mechanism works well, has the collusion resistant properties, if and only if you take the base fee revenues and reroute them anywhere other than the producer of that block. For the game theory, it doesn't matter where it goes as long as it does not go to the block producer, okay? So that leads to another design question, which is like, okay, so we know where we can't set that revenue. Where should we set the revenue? And there's different answers to this question. You can imagine different variants of EIP-1559 with different answers. The version of EIP-1559, which is deployed, which operates today in Ethereum, I think primarily initially just for simplicity purposes, uh, you know, dispenses with that revenue in the most straightforward way, right? But just by sending it to dev null, literally removing the currency from circulation, burning it, okay? And one point I wanna make is everything I've said up to this point until we got to this, you know, burning property, everything else about EIP 1559 
didn't really rely on the fact that Ethereum has a native currency. That all would have been basically the same had transaction fees always been denominated in, say, USDC. This is the part of the mechanism which you could not do without this power of accessing a native currency and being able to burn it, right? Like if fees were in USDC, you know, you could try, you could burn a USDC on Ethereum, but that's not really burning the US dollar. That's burning a representation of a US dollar in a vault that, you know, the, the representation on the Ethereum blockchain. It's very different to literally delete the, the currency which uh, is tracked by that blockchain itself. Okay, so this is where we see the power um, in this particular mechanism. And again, with that power comes responsibilities, comes macroeconomic consequences. Uh, so here we have a force that's going in the opposite direction of the block rewards. Block rewards were inflationary. So here burning revenues, that's gonna be deflationary. That takes coins out of circulation. In Ethereum today, on any given day, there's gonna be a tug of war between inflationary and deflationary forces. Any given day, one of those might win over the other. Long term, you know, I do think most of us expect um, Ethereum's currency to be deflationary uh, in the long run, okay? How, do we, how should we feel about that? Right, so this macroeconomic, you know, unlike Bitcoin, where it's very explicit, like the whole point, you started with the macroeconomic policy decision, 21 million Bitcoins. Here we're getting a macroeconomic consequence rather as a byproduct of our microeconomic goals of wanting to have a transaction fee mechanism uh, with good UX and then to dispense with base fee revenue in the simplest possible way. So is this macroeconomic byproduct good or bad? The answer depends very much who you ask. You ask anyone who holds ETH, they're gonna love, they love this mechanism. They think EIP 1559 is the best thing ever. What's the reasoning? So this, this sort of saying, well, like, let's think of Ethereum's market cap as fixed, independent of the number of tokens which happen to be in circulation. Well then, right, if the number of, if the, if the, if the supply goes down and the market cap stays fixed, the, per, the price per token, of course, increases. And so that's why ETH holders are happy about this idea. Honestly, if you ask anyone who's sort of trained in classical macroeconomics and you tell them this, they're like, oh my God, that's a horrible idea. And they start telling you stories about sort of stag stagnation in, in Japan in the 1990s. You know, if your reaction is like, well, how much does 1990s Japan really have to do with Ethereum's cryptocurrency? I, I kind of sympathize with that, but it does kind of throw the gauntlet a little bit. I mean, really, we don't have a satisfactory, I'd say, discussion even of whether, you know, these are sort of different scenarios uh, or not. Okay, so in large part, I'd say this is an open question, um, though certainly in sort of this community, it's mostly viewed as a, as a good thing. One quick final example. Uh, this is maybe less squarely part of crypto economics. I think this would meet some people's definitions, um, but not others. But I did wanna say at least a little bit about the application layer. I did wanna say a little bit about sort of the most recent work that I've been doing, uh, which concerns automated market makers. I assume this concept is familiar to many of you, right? The goal of an exchange is to allow people to buy and sell one asset for another, let's say ETH for USDC. Traditional markets, you'd use a limit order book. Limit order books are a poor fit for most modern blockchain protocols. They're just too expensive. They need to do too much storage. They need to do too much computation. Those are two things that are very scarce uh, in typical modern uh, blockchain protocols. So automated market makers are just a much simpler way of doing exchange uh, where you're pretty much always ready to do business. There's always a spot price at which the, the AMM will be willing to buy or sell uh, at that given price. And that price is some simple function of the current quantities of the, of the two tokens, okay? And um, one thing I wanna point out is, you know, I'd say for AMM design, cryptocurrencies is not, unlike the first two mechanisms we talked about, unlike block rewards, unlike EIP 1559, cryptocurrencies is really not fundamental to AMMs. Yes, AMMs are often used to trade cryptocurrencies, but you can trade anything with an AMMs. It could be any assets, doesn't matter, okay? Furthermore, the operation of the AMM itself, all of the steps that it takes, it never references a native currency. It never needs to mint, it never needs to burn. This is why Uniswap could launch originally without a native token. Okay, it just didn't need one for its AMMs to work as intended. Okay? So rather, this is a problem which is novel, which we're considering because the scarcity, the computational scarcity of the blockchain protocols that we use to secure cryptocurrencies, that computational power is so scarce, it forces us to look at other designs, which then gives us new research problems to think about. 
So what, what's, what's sort of the work we've been doing, uh, I and co-authors have been doing recently on automated market makers. We've been focusing on the cost benefit analysis that's faced by liquidity providers. Liquidity providers, remember, they're the ones who deposit coins in these AMMs in the first place in exchange for uh, a share of the trading fees. And so the question is, you know, when is that a good decision? Okay, the benefit is obvious. You get a share of the trading fees, so that's some amount of money. What is the cost that you incur as, an, as a liquidity provider in an AMM? Well, it's something known as adverse selection, okay, which basically means that you may be forced uh, to execute trades at unfavorable prices. So for example, if the spot price of the AMM becomes stale and gets corrected by an arbitrageur, that arbitrageur is going to be making money at the expense of the LPs. So that's where the costs come from, adverse selection costs being forced to execute trades at suboptimal prices. How can we isolate, measure, and characterize those costs? The old answer is impermanent loss, which has its uses. Um, our critique of impermanent loss is that it conflates two things. It conflates the, the thing we really care about, which is adverse selection costs, but that can be occluded by price movements in the underlying assets, okay, which makes it difficult to interpret why the impermanent loss might be high or low, which of these two is the, is the key factor. So the new concept is something we call lever, LVR, that's for loss versus rebalancing. Uh, and you can think of that as sort of, you know, taking permanent loss and mod out, in some sense, by the price movements of the underlying assets. So sort of if you hedge all the hedgeable parts of impermanent loss, lever is like the unhedgeable residue that remains. Okay? So I don't have much time to talk about this. Um, I will say, you know, I think the math actually turns out um, pretty nice. Uh, you can check out the paper that's with my PhD student, Jason Milionis, my colleague, uh, CMAC Molemi at Columbia, and Anthony Lee Zhang at Chicago. There's also uh, a couple of YouTube, there's YouTube talks by, I think, all of us uh, at this point if you wanna, if you wanna learn more. All right, so let me just take a couple minutes um, to wrap up with some challenges for crypto economics. Just like my examples were no way exhaustive, neither are these challenges. Uh, I just wanted to group some of my thoughts in, in three different themes. So I'll say a little bit about each of the themes and then the, the example questions I'll just, I'll just let you read. So grand challenge number one might be the most ambitious of all, which is to make macroeconomics our own. And here when I say our, what I mean is you know, basically the community in this room. So computer science researchers, you know, blockchain researchers, et cetera. This is something we have seen happen uh, with other parts of economics, right? So game theory has been around forever. Computer scientists got very interested in it largely about 25 years ago and made it their own in the sense that they brought a lot of new stuff to the table and adapted it for their own applications. They brought computational complexity. They brought, talked about the price of anarchy. We saw it again with mechanism design. Okay, again, computer scientists over time eventually added a number of new dimensions to that field. Focuses on, for example, communication complexity, uh, sort of uh, prior, free, uh, prior free auction design, and so on. So the hope is that we see that happen again with macroeconomics, as you can already see in these 20 minutes, like there's really reasons we'd like to do that, right? Like is the hard cap in Bitcoin a good idea or a bad idea? Like is deflation in a cryptocurrency good or bad? These, absolutely basic questions. We really don't have theory guiding us about, about how to think about it. Okay, so this, is, this might be a long-term challenge. This might be 10, 10 to 20 years, uh, but I do think it's gonna be, gonna be worth it. I should say, thus far, there has been basically zero interaction between computer science and macroeconomics. Okay. You know, I've given you know, dozens of seminars at, at econ departments. We always go out to dinner afterwards. Not once, not once has there been a macro, macroeconomist uh, at the dinner following my seminar. Right? There's just very little interaction thus far. All right, so the second challenge is the one I think we're furthest along on. Uh, so it's basically taking an area where there's already been a lot of really nice ideas, and just uh, the goal is to develop into a sort of mature, um, crisp theory, which is incentives at, the, at layer one, okay? And so I'm thinking about things like, you know, for example, proof of stake, you know, slashing, in protocol recovery from sort of 51% attacks. We, again, we've seen a lot of good ideas, you know, for example, in ETH2, for example, in Eigenlayer, I think we're making lots of progress, but it would be great to have a theory that's as sort of nailed down as, for example, the theory of fault tolerance in distributed computing, where we have a million different models, and in all of the models, we kind of know exactly the threshold at which you can achieve consensus uh, or not. So I think there are big opportunities to, to really take this to the next level. Finally, and this again, I think there's been some progress, but there's tons to do, is to understand crypto economics at each layer of the blockchain stack and also the interactions between those layers. So thus far we've seen most of the focus on L1, fair amount of focus on the application layer and not much elsewhere, frankly. 
Okay, so layer zero, so the peer-to-peer -peer network for disseminating transactions, super important part of the stack, very understudied from a game theoretic perspective. Okay, I really hope that changes soon. Layer twos, you know, they're kind of new, um, so maybe that's why, but we haven't seen a lot about the economics of layer twos and how they interact uh, with the other layers either. MEV, I largely think of as an example of this layer-to-layer -layer interaction between the consensus layer or the execution layer and the, and the application layer. Uh, and so, you know, people like to claim MEV is unavoidable. I would like to see a theorem that states that fact. More generally, I would like to understand, you know, is all this messy interaction we're seeing between the different layers of the blockchain stack, is that a fundamental aspect of designing decentralized systems, or actually do we just need to think of some new architectures where we can get much cleaner separations uh, between the various layers? So I think I'm out of time. Let me stop there. Thanks. I have a question. You good? Hey, Tim. I do. So in the second last slide, you said uh, grand challenge number two is slashing optimal, right? Isn't that one of the questions you ask? So is slashing necessary in some sense, which of course the question then is like necessary for what? Yeah, how do you actually even formulate that question? That's, you can ask that question about almost everything I wrote in these last three slides. Yeah, sorry, sorry. The, the question was, you know, how do I, what do I even mean by kind of, is slashing necessary, like necessary for what? When I say optimal economic security, you know, like what do I mean? Uh, you know, this is characteristic of being at the very, very early days of the scientific field, which is like all the parts are moving at the same time. We, 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 we're not sure about our definitions, we're not sure about our problem statements, we're not sure about our theorem statements, we're not sure about our proofs, they're all moving. Um, so I'm open. Um, to, to, to how to do that. I mean, slashing in particular, for starters, I would just be very happy to see a result which says, you know, consider some property P, uh, you know, on the one hand, a possibility, was, you know, like maybe it has something to do with in protocol recovery from 51% attacks or something like that. A possibility result, you know, saying that you can do it with slashing. We already have examples, um, you know, where we have results of that form, for example, in, in ETH2. But then what we're lacking is sort of impossibility results. And so you have to define a space of all possible permissionless protocols. You have to say what it means that the protocol does not do slashing, like it doesn't sort of secretly do it in some hidden way. And then you'd want to prove an impossibility result that says you cannot actually achieve property P um, in as broad a range of parameters as you could with slashing. And ideally P is something we really care about, but at least to get the ball rolling, I would like to see that true for any P. Alternatively, maybe there's some black box reduction. You give me a system that relies on slashing, I'll give you back some transformation of that system with the same economic guarantees, but without, without using slashing. I don't know. So. Thank you. Of course. Um, I have a question related to your grand challenge number three. Um, so I'd like to see your view on, so you talk about L1, L2, how to get money or the value from the application layer, but theoretically is application layer could collapse all the layers and grab the value from the L2, for example. Um, what I mean, give you a concrete example is that for the L2 today's, they pretty much cannot, from economic perspective, sustain itself. The sequencers won't capture much value, the token won't accrue value because of sequencer revenues. Technically, if the app, uh, like app chain, like a lot of people are talking about today, is you could build into the layer two scaling functions into the D app itself, and you basically remove the layer two altogether, and you capture that value in the uh, app uh, D app, and also you can actually create a new usage of your app tokens, utility of app tokens, to basically for the sequencers and stuff. Um, so this dynamic, I think, going to happen, whether you like it or not, because whoever controls the user eventually have the most revenue, they don't want to pass along to lower layer. Uh, I think same thing happened today. I just saw, like, for example, ZK Bridge. Technically, if you build the ZK Bridge into your application, you could remove the bridge revenue or the bridge functions altogether. Um, I just want to see your view on this and how do you think the dynamic it looks like and what's your recommendation? So, so just to understand, you're saying, you, you expect all the value capture to move up to the application layer. That's your conjecture. Because they, they, so the value passing down, they pass from, uh, from the user to application to layer two to layer one, 
But again, so like I just want to make a mix. Yeah, understand. correct. You're saying your conjecture is that all of the value capture will go up to the application layer. Right. The question okay. is whether they want to pass along to layer two or layer one instead of layer one. Say, I want to capture value of your application so I can survive. Yeah, as you know, layer I, two. I think I think that's plausible. Um, you know, I, I'm a theoretician by nature, so you know, anecdotes I find helpful, but okay. ultimately I'm not really satisfied until there's a formal analysis. And of course, obviously that's going to be in some model where you make some assumptions. The assumptions may or may not be true. Okay. So there's, there's all, all that stuff. But just, I mean, part of being so early to the space, I mean, I just, I hope you all have this visceral sense too. Like we've just explored so little of the design space that's out there for every single part of the stack, frankly. Yeah. So to, I'm always very nervous when someone says like, you can't do X or like X has to happen no matter you know, what design you use. Because right. we do not have good mental models for the design space yet. Yeah. You can always, like with math, you can prove an impossibility result, right? You can say like, well, here's like a very weak notion of a permissionless protocol that like, you know, would satisfy anything we could possibly imagine. And here's a mathematical proof that you can't do X with any protocol in that family. So yeah. some, to someone like me, that's the really sort of forceful argument. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with your logic. To me, that's just, I would, I would view that as a conjecture. And I would think an interesting, open, an interesting problem, or at least exercise, would be to set up plausible economic models and dynamics under which, at least in the long run, you see exactly the same dynamics that you're predicting. I think that yeah. that's, you know, for someone like me, that's, that's kind of what I would like to see. OK. Yeah, yeah this is like a counterintuitive. Like, you think L1 would grab value from L Right. Yeah, let's move on. I yeah, want to make sure everyone has a turn, so yeah. <clears throat> um, so it seems like behavioral economics plays a role in uh, people's like what's happening right now, we're in a bear market, and that's driven at least in part by um, people's you know, personal biases, et cetera. Is there a way to run more intelligent experiments, macroeconomic experiments, now that we have this new primitive um, to see how people respond to? Or, or can those really be modeled uh, perfectly using game theory? Yeah, that's a, that's, a great, that's a great question. So it's sort of a question of like what, you know, when we're modeling people's preferences, you know, what kind of fidelity do we need? I mean, one thing I want to point out is, you know, behavioral economics is usually more on the microeconomic side, or at least I see it show up largely as a corrective uh, on the microeconomic side, you know, to, I don't know, like instead of just assuming people have quasi-linear utility, you assume they have something um, else. Um, I will say, like, I, I sympathize with your comment in that especially, like if you look at my bottom one on Grand Challenge 1, you know, which is just like what drives token price, which of course you can imagine at A16Z, all of our projects are very interested in having better mental models for this. Mm -hmm. That's the question where I do wonder if what you bring up is gonna make it very difficult. That the answer may just be so dependent on you know, these things like the cycles and the bubbles um, and that without some kind of unrealistically deep understanding of the psychology, you may not be able to get a very accurate answer to that last question. A lot of the other ones here, I'm not sure it's crucial that you deeply understand the psychology of, of sort of users of these protocols, like hard cap or not. It's not obvious to me that that would be so, so dependent on what your model is of people's preferences. Even with like inflation as a, so like if you buy the idea that the reason that people reinvest their, their money during a downturn is because they think that inflation is eating their money away. Yeah, this is again sort of getting back to the last question on this slide. Okay. Right? Which is, so like if you're, if you're like a trader type and you're focused on prices, uh, that uh, may be out of reach because of the psychological aspects. If you look at the questions on this slide, they are not all of, they're mostly not of that nature. Right. Right. So. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone.